Good evening, everyone. My name is Tina Morrison, and I serve as the Assistant Dean of Philanthropy for the College of Sciences, and it's wonderful to be able to host this event in person again. However, none of us would be here tonight if it weren't for the support of the Coe family and other generous contributors who established a fund that would support the Cuomo Coe Lecture year after year. This endowment has enabled us to keep this event free and open to the public as a way to honor the legacy of Dr. Coe and his impact on students, faculty, and the greater community. Of course, endowments like this help us plan for the future in the face of other budget uncertainties, but please know that gifts of all sizes can really make a positive impact. To make a bad math joke, all gifts count. On March 20th, the university will celebrate its annual Day of Giving. Many of you have probably participated or heard of this, where we have a chance to raise the profile of the math department in addition to the other departments and units in the college. For those who are interested in giving back or getting involved, please consider a contribution of $10 or more if you're able to give on March 20th. Of course, we do receive donations uh, to the department and college throughout the year. Uh, and I will be available after the lecture to answer any questions that you have. And most of this information is also listed on our website. Thank you to the many people here who have already supported and contributed, and to you all for coming out this evening to join us. I will now turn things over to the Leroy B. Martin, Jr., Distinguished Professor and Head of our Mathematics Department, Dr. Elena Chertok, to introduce our distinguished speaker. We're happy to restart our whole lecture series and this public lecture in the ninth in the annual series honoring our late colleague, Dr. Cole. The goal of this lecture series is to communicate the importance of mathematics and its impact on sciences, technology, and society. We are honored and delighted to have Dr. Robert Rice of the University of Pennsylvania as our speaker today. Dr. Rice is an Andrea Mitchell Professor of Mathematics and Electrical and System Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. After earning a Bachelor degree in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Toledo in 1991 and a Master degree and PhD in Applied Mathematics from Cornell University in 1995, Dr. Rice held positions in the Mathematics Department at the University of Texas, Austin, Georgia Tech, and the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign. Dr. Rice has been at, Penn State, uh, at UPenn sorry, since uh, 2008. He's a recognized leader in the field of applied algebraic topology, with publications detailing topological methods for sensor networks, robotics, signal processes, data, data analysis, optimization, and more. Dr. Rice is the author of the leading textbook on the subject, Elementary Applied Topology, from 2014. His research has been recognized with NSF Career, NSF PKs, Science and 50, and Manier Bush Faculty Fellow Awards. He's been an invited speaker at two international congress of mathematicians. He's a dedicated expositor and communicator of mathematics with teaching awards that include the MAA James Crawford Prize, Penn Lindbeck Award, and the Brian Warren Award in Engineering at Penn. He currently serves as Associate Dean of Undergraduate Education for the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences in Penn. Today, Dr. Rice will talk about information dynamics of social networks. Please welcome Dr. Rice. Very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. It's so nice to be able to kick this off in person again. I think I was supposed to be here back in 2020 and that didn't work out so well. I keep hearing from people about the positive influence that Professor Ko had on so many people and it's really an honor to be able to speak here in his name and I'll try to do a good job. I'm speaking to a broad audience, a nice big audience, and what I would like to do is make sure that my clicker works. Come on, there we go. I would like to give a talk that has as few prerequisites as possible. So let's, let's see, I gotta have something to work with. And sometimes I may break these rules a little bit, but there's a couple of things that I would like if we all start off with. One is a little bit about networks. You know, things like social networks, we're all familiar with that, right? People, nodes, edges, connections. 
I'm going to need a little bit of linear algebra. And maybe if you're an undergrad here, maybe you've had some linear algebra, maybe you haven't. Think matrices, not that bad. Occasionally, I'll use language that's a little more, yeah, but you know, there it goes. The third thing that you need, this is most important, what's it going to be? That's a weird picture. I don't know how to describe it. I might say vision, but what I really mean by that is guts. A little bit of courage, because sometimes I'm going to go off and just start saying some crazy things. I'm going to need you to roll with it. Sometimes I'm just going to have to boom, 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 go through stuff real fast because I got a lot of stuff and not enough time. And sometimes they're just going to throw up a slide that's like, oh my gosh, what was there? Fortunately, we live in a world where we got the, the cell phone cameras. So you see that icon in the upper right hand corner? What is that? This is a little camera. When you see that on a slide, if this is the kind of thing where you're like, oh, I would like to learn more about it, this is the kind of slide where, you know, take a picture and then you can look at it later. Or if you're watching the video of this, you know, skip the boring part. Scroll ahead to where there's a little camera icon in the upper right hand corner. And then that's the thing to pay attention to if you're looking to learn more about what I'm talking about. Because I can't give every possible detail on everything. So, courage, vision, guts. You okay? Yes? yes. Okay, good. Let's go then. And what are we going to do? Let's, let's talk politics. Who wants to talk about politics, right? Who are you going to vote for? How about the old guy, five letter name? I don't really want to talk about politics. Maybe you don't want to talk about politics either, but we got we to gotta do something. Let's back up to a, you know, a more generic proxy for that. Let's just talk about opinions, just opinions about things, all kinds of things. There's a really interesting area in applied mathematics called opinion dynamics. That's what we're going to be talking about today. What do I mean by that? Let's, uh, let's assume that you've got a social network. You know, something like Facebook, where you've got people and you've got connections between people. This is going to be um, undirected, not like Twitter, where you might follow me and I might or I might not follow you. Facebook is symmetric or undirected, looks something like this. And then let's say we're all talking about our opinion about some thing. I, I don't know, maybe it's the president or maybe it's something and you might have a negative opinion. No, I don't like it. You might have a positive opinion. Yes, this is, this is great. I have a positive opinion. You might be like, meh, I don't really care, right? The way that we can keep track of this and the intensity of that opinion is to topologize it, it's a fancy word, I just think of it as the, the real number line where I totally don't care would be zero, and then I have a range of intensity for positive and a range of intensity for negative opinions. And that's where we're going to get started today. And the classical problem is if you have a whole bunch of people with all their opinions and then they start influencing each other, what is going to happen to those opinions? How does this change over time? That's how dynamics works. So everyone might start off with an initial opinion on something that's all over the map, positive and negative, and then as you interact, as you talk, as you influence the people around you and are influenced, maybe you crystallize into pockets of intense belief, polarization. That would be one possible outcome. Another possible outcome would be something like a consensus state where everyone just sort of believes the same thing and maybe it's a strong opinion or maybe it's a very weak opinion. How does this work? There's a classical result or two. The one that I'm going to talk about dates from 1968 by Taylor. Similar uh, work, more on the sociology side by De Groot, about the same time. Note the date on this. This is happening in a period that we now look back and say that was, that was sort of some uh, turbulence here in America at the time, politically. Good thing we're all done with that. What uh, this classical work does is uses something called the graph Laplacian in order to prove a result. What do I mean by that? I said I was going to keep the prereq slow, so I want to take a few minutes and explain what I mean by the graph Laplacian. Now we teach this to our, our undergrads in engineering, but uh, you know I didn't learn about it when I was an undergrad, so no shame if you haven't seen this before. It's really beautiful, but definitely worth knowing. 
So let's go back. What is the graph Laplace? The graph Laplace starts off with a graph. We've got some vertices, we've got some edges. Let's number the vertices. The graph Laplace is a matrix. It's a matrix that's square, whose size is the number of vertices by the number of vertices. And this is the difference between two matrices, D and A. What are these? D is something called the degree matrix. It's a square matrix, it's a diagonal matrix, hence the D. And the entries along those diagonals are the degrees of the vertices. What do I mean by that? Look at a vertex, this is vertex number four. How many edges are going into it? How many edges are going into it? Three. It's three, so that fourth entry along the diagonal is a three. This is very simple, this is a degree matrix. What is A? A is something called the adjacency matrix. This is the thing that keeps track of which people are connected in the network. So if I look at an edge, this edge is between vertex two and vertex four. That means second row, fourth column, there's a one. And if there's, there's no edge, then it's a zero. Oh, but wait, uh, if two and four are connected, four and two are connected, because we're doing Facebook, not Twitter, so this is a symmetric matrix and we can flip the rows and columns like that. We take the difference between these two matrices. This gives us something called the Laplacian, or L. Now maybe you've seen Laplacians before. Maybe you've seen Laplacians in like, I don't know, calculus class or partial differential equations or things like that. It doesn't look anything like this. Why is this a, is this a second derivative of something? Doesn't look like it. We'll talk about that a little bit later. This is an amazingly useful matrix. What a wonderful matrix. Useful in all kinds of things. Uh, in the engineering world, uh, we are really big on something called spectral graph theory, which looks at the eigenvalues, eigenvectors of this matrix, if you've had some linear algebra. Super, super important for things like clustering, or compression, or consensus, or stuff like that. On the machine learning side, we use this a lot in graph signal processing, uh, graph neural networks, stuff like that there. Okay, so oh, wait a second, we were talking about uh, opinions and politics and things like that. Let's get back to that. This classical result by Taylor uses the graph Laplacian to set up a diffusion, a differential equation on people's opinions. Remember, everyone has a real number, and this is over every vertex. Let's call that vector of opinions x. It's going to depend on continuous time t, and we're going to evolve it by saying that people talk to their neighbors and change their opinions based on this graph Laplacian, but we put a, a negative constant in front of it. This alpha is positive, we've got a minus sign in front of it. This is a heat equation. This is a heat equation over the data on the vertices of this graph. If you were to discretize this so that you're looking at discrete time instead of continuous time, do like an Euler step kind of a thing, t plus one versus t, that what you get moving the one guy over to the other side is this recurrence relation, where instead of the matrix L with the minus alpha in front of it, you've got the identity because you move this guy over to the other side. And if you iterate that over and over again, it acts by diffusion, but discreetly in time. What's the result? What's the theorem? The theorem is, just like temperature on a bar, under the heat equation, whoop, everything uh, diffuses. And it neutralizes. And no matter what opinions everybody starts out with over time, eventually, everything goes to constant. Everyone believes the same exact thing. As long as we let time go enough. This is great. And in fact, you get see how fast you get there. The speed of convergence is based on the eigenvalues of this matrix L. What do the eigenvalues of this matrix look like? This is where spectral graph theory gets started. Let's go back to the basics there. One of the things you could say about this graph Laplacian is you have one zero eigenvalue for every connected component of the graph. So if your network's connected, then you have zero as an eigenvalue with multiplicity one, and then all your other eigenvalues are going to be positive, strictly positive. This is called a positive semi-definite matrix. Really, really useful. This is very nice. What this means is that the first positive 
number that you get for that eigenvalue is telling you the speed of convergence down there. Now, why is it? Why does it have this property? There's another way to explain what this graph Laplacian is in terms of this guy right here, B times B transpose, where B is a boundary matrix. What we do is we label all the edges and we put arrows on them. Which way? I don't know, any kind of way you want. It doesn't matter. And then what we do is we set up a matrix that is not a square matrix. It's got rows corresponding to uh, the vertices and columns corresponding to the edges. And you can see in each of those columns, I have a plus one and a minus one. That means the edge goes from this vertex, minus one, to this vertex, plus one. And then if you, let me go back, if you take the transpose of that times this matrix, you get that square matrix, you get that Laplace. And because of this structure, it's kind of like you're, you're, doing this, you're doing this boundary thing twice. Very reminiscent of a Laplacian, meaning something like a second derivative. And that's why it has these nice spectral properties, and that's why this theorem is true. And that's why, in a social context, if we all talk to each other and influence each other, we all eventually come to agreement. And, and, the more connected we are, the more that principal eigenvalue gets, uh, gets pushed out, the faster we come to consensus. So based on this result from the late 1960s, they would predict that with the advent of social media and much more communication, that harmony would spread and peace and equality of opinions. And here we are. Here we are. How'd that work out? Yeah, I don't know. We got some problems. Okay. But it's not that this theorem is false. No, it's true theorem given the hypotheses. It's just that, you know, things are probably a little bit more complicated. That's good news for applied mathematicians. We love, we love it when things don't work and we have to work harder to figure it out. So that's exactly what has happened. And the field of opinion dynamics is just Boom, 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 especially in recent years for some reason. I, I don't know why people are interested in how discourse spreads over social media. But here we are, and there's a whole bunch of papers. And oh, you see that icon in the upper right-hand corner? Right? If you're interested, you can take a little picture real quick and then look some of those papers up. And you can see I stopped writing it down after like 2021 or 2022 because I just can't keep track of it anymore. There are so many papers coming up with more and more and more models for all kinds of different sorts of things. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing. Most of these models are really based on graph theory, the way that the classical result is. And the, the powerhouse, the thing that gets the job done, is the linear algebra associated with the graphs. And it's all solid work, good work. This is a really interesting subject, lots of great applied math there. But, I have a slightly different goal. What I want to talk about today is ways to get past this. I want to present a simple model with some broad applicability, I think, that goes beyond the, the sort of basic linear algebra. Now, I said I wasn't going to ask for anything other than linear algebra, so I'm going to, I'm going to keep it in the linear algebra world for as long as possible. But I'm going to, I'm going to take some forays to some interesting places. What do I mean by transcend linear algebra? Well, here's what I mean. What do you do in linear algebra? You study vector spaces, right? Isn't that what linear algebra class is all about? 14 weeks of vector spaces? No. No, 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 no. That's like maybe, that's like maybe week one. Because what's really interesting in linear algebra is linear transformations, in matrices. But really, linear transformations, the things that take you from one vector space to another. Anytime you see a matrix, you think, what is it doing? It's a verb, not a noun. OK, but that's linear algebra. What comes after linear algebra? When linear algebra grows up, one of the things it turns into is called homological algebra, which is a big, scary word, but not a scary idea. Because what you're doing is, at least in the beginning, you're looking at sequences of linear transformations, or grids of linear transformations or full networks of linear transformations. And that's just the beginning of this big and interesting subject. And I'm not going to go too far down this road, but we're going we're to go there a little bit. 
that word homological means that it relates to homology. What is homology? Homology is a big subject, it takes a while to learn, but you can draw some pretty pictures and think about it in a nice way. Homology is a way to characterize algebraic data, and in the simplest case, it's just using basic ideas from linear algebra. Now, I can't give full definitions and a complete understanding of it, so I'm going to give you, um, I don't know how to say, more the engineering perspective. We've been talking about graphs, networks. You can raise those to higher dimensional things by adding faces or three-dimensional uh, chunks, tetrahedra. These simple pieces or simplices lead to something called a simplicial complex. It's a generalization of a network. There's no reason to stop there. You can keep going, talk about cell complexes where you have more interesting higher dimensional faces like squares, cubes, other stuff as well. Are there details here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But look at the picture and nod your head up and down and say, oh, that's cool. I like this. I like homology. Awesome. I think of homology as a compression algorithm. This is not the way it appears in the books. So listen, listen to this because I'm, I'm dropping some gold here. If you think about how to put together one of these simplicial complexes, one of these graphs, you start off with some vertices, right? Or think about those vertices as the basis of a vector space. I'm going to call that vector space C0 since those vertices are zero dimensional. So what is a vector space? How many dimensions does it have? How many vertices are there? Five, okay, so five dimensional vector space. And then I add some edges, and there's a bunch of edges, how many, you don't have to count, I'll tell you, it's nine. And the, the, that's the basis for a nine dimensional vector space, I'm gonna call it C1, since those are one dimensional things, simplices. If we add some two dimensional simplices, some, some triangular faces in there, I've got a bunch of them, I don't know, six, that gives me a six dimensional vector space, and then that's it. If I had higher dimensional things, I would add them, but I, I don't, so there we go. Now this is just counting. I need more than counting. I need to know how everything's assembled. I need things that are telling me what is connected to what. Those are linear transformations on these vector spaces that are, I'm calling them, what, what's that letter? Oh, it's a B, it's a B. We've seen that letter before, right? When we're talking about the graph Laplacian, there was the boundary matrix. These are boundary matrices that tell you what pieces get attached to what other pieces. Okay, so you set that up and there's a little bit more algebraic stuff that goes on here having to do with which way do the arrows point, but if you use a little bit of the language that you learn in a linear algebra class, things like kernels, things like images, things like quotients, then what you get is a compression all this data in this sequence of linear transformations is not efficient. I can smash it down to its core without breaking anything. And the, the optimal compression that I can do is taking these kernels of these linear transformations, modding up by images. What I get is a sequence of vector spaces with really just zero maps in between them. So it looks kind of like the same object, but it's much simpler much lower dimensional. And indeed, if you look at that simplicial complex, it looks kind of like a, a, a ball, triangulated, or really the boundary of a ball, like a, a two-dimensional sphere. The simplest model of which would just have one zero-dimensional cell, and then one two-dimensional cell that wraps over it. Now, the real story in homology is a little bit more complicated than this, but as a cartoon example, it's not bad. It's not bad. Think about this homology as a compression scheme for this algebraic type of data, and you'll go right. Homology comes as a sequence. H0 is measuring things like uh, connectivity, how many connected components there are. That's a, that's a phrase that we've heard once already today. That's what the dimension of H0 is. The dimension of H1 is measuring a different type of connectivity. It's measuring uh, cycles in graph theory, the kinds of holes that a cycle can represent or see. And then H2 is measuring a different kind of hole, something like a cavity in a hollow 
ball. And then there's higher dimensional things as well, which we're not, I can't draw those pictures as easily. Okay. What is useful about this? Oh, that's a long story. You got to talk to some experts here. If you want to find out some of the uses of homology, you got to talk to Radmila Sazdanovich, who does some topological data analysis. You got to talk to Eric Hansen, who's a postdoc here, who does homological algebra and its applications to data. You need to talk to them. I'm not going to be able to give you the full story here. Why? Because we're not done. We need more math to be able to get back on track with our story. Oh gosh, what do we need that's more than this? Well, buckle up, take a drink. There we go. Okay, we're going to talk about sheaves for a few minutes. Now, don't run out. You can't, they lock the doors. You're stuck here. What's a sheaf? In the same way that I present homology as a compression scheme, like a JPEG. A sheaf is just a data structure. And in the simplest examples that we're talking about, this data structure lives over a network and it's algebraic in nature based on linear algebra, based on vector spaces, based on linear transformations. Those are the only kinds of sheaves that we're really going to worry about today. And they're really very lovely things that are going to adapt to social networks really well. So think about a graph. Simplest case, vertices, edges, none of those higher dimensional simplices, that's our base space. And over top of each element, we have data, algebraic data in the form of a vector space. So over this vertex, I got a vector space. Over that vertex, I got a vector space. Over this edge between them, I have a vector space. Is it the same vector space? No. Could be totally different vector spaces. I could have totally different dimensions. I could have a three dimensional one over here, and a nine dimensional one over here, and a seven-dimensional one over here, whatever, it's fine. And then it just keeps going, going. These things, these vector spaces, this data, these are called stocks. And that's where the, the information is going to live. But just vector spaces are not interesting, right? What's the interesting part of linear algebra? Do the interpretive dance, right? It's the, the things that, that point. It's the, the maps. It's the morphisms the linear transformations that tell you how the data is all connected together. And the way that the graph is connected together, this edge, these vertices, is mirrored upstairs on the data level by a network of linear transformations. This is what a network sheaf is. If you have a higher dimensional thing downstairs, you can keep going inductively. It's really cool. Now, this is not the usual sheaf theory. If you pick up a book on sheaf theory, it's a lot more complicated because that's General theory was built to do some very hard and very specific things. This is a much simpler theory that has its roots back in the 50s and then rediscovered pretty much every 20 years and then forgotten about. The latest iteration was in uh, Justin Curry's thesis about a decade ago. And there's a whole theory associated with these sheaves over cell complexes. It's really beautiful, really powerful, and increasingly really useful. There's one aspect of this theory that we're going to need and I'm going to have to talk about and then the pain goes away for a little while but but pain incoming. Okay we have to talk about something called cohomology, sheaf cohomology. Wow we talked about homology. Did you get all that? I hope so. You're going to need it. We're going to do the same kind of thing here where what we're going to do is we're going to take all of the data that's over top of the vertices, that's over top of the edges, bundle it all together in a way and try to compress it out, try to extract the interesting parts. Because I'm talking about sheaves over networks, we're just going to focus on the, the sort of the simple part. I'm going to take all the vector spaces over all the vertices and just, boom, bundle them together. Uh, direct sum, if you like. I'm going to do the same thing over the edges. Take all those vector spaces, all that data over all the connections, boom, mash it together. And then I'm going to build one big linear transformation between them. Something that uses the maps in the sheaf. The thing that takes data over vertices to data over edges and measures pairwise differences between vertex data as represented over the edges. This is like the boundary matrix that we looked at in the graph Laplacian, but this is called a co-boundary operator and it has a different symbol delta. 
you do the same kinds of linear algebraic constructions, kernels, images, things like that. In this case, if you're just looking at the kernel of this co-boundary map, this gives you something called the zero cohomology. Do you remember what the zero homology measured? Connected pieces, connected components of something like a graph. This is a little bit different. This is connected components of the data structure. I have this very complicated data structure living over top, and I'm looking for connected components of that. These are sometimes called sections or global sections. OK, that's a lot of pain. And then it gets more complicated in higher dimensions with all this scary language. That's why we got the little camera icon up there. You can take a picture. Let's, I don't know, let's look at something that's a little bit more uh, realistic, physical, example, something like that. Let's just say that I have one dimensional vector spaces over everything, like, you know, positive, negative, zero. And I've got a choice of data over each vertex. That's what an element of this C0 vector space looks like. It's just a, a data distribution over the vertices. What happens is I use the maps in the sheaf to map the data from the vertices to the data structure over the edges. And that map is just some linear transformation. It might be doing whatever, I don't know. The co-boundary operator is measuring the distance between coming from the left, coming from the right. Are they far apart? Are they close? Do they match? If the distance is zero, then the data over those two vertices is compatible over the edge. It matches. Everything's harmonious. That is what a section looks like. That's what zero-dimensional cohomology looks like for a sheaf. OK. These types of sheaves, sheaf cohomology, they show up in lots of different examples. The simplest possible example I can think of is just a simple linear transformation between two vector spaces. Got a matrix A, goes from vector space U to vector space V. Let's put a zero dimensional vector space over the other vertex on that side. Then the zero dimensional cohomology is just the kernel of the linear transformation. The one dimensional cohomology is just the co kernel of this linear transformation, if you've heard that term before. If not, just play with kernels. That's fine, because we're only ever going to need zero-dimensional cohomology for the rest of today. Wait, we're actually going to need this stuff today? Yes. I'm afraid so. Now, if you want other examples of cellular sheaves, there's been a lot of work. I cannot fit it all on one slide, but there's a bunch of different stuff, including some recent applications to things associated with graph neural networks, machine learning, stuff like that. Really cool stuff. But we we're supposed to talk about politics. Why are we talking about politics? We should talk about politics. And let's do an interesting example of a sheaf. This is something called a discourse sheaf, because we're, we're talking, 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 talking. This is joint work with Jacob Hansen, who was a PhD student of mine. He now works at Blue Light AI. And in the process of trying to explain sheaves to other people and come up with a, uh, an example that people could understand, we started working with the following, which had some independent interest. The stocks over the vertices, the stocks over the people in a social network, are vector spaces of opinions, but personal opinions, basis opinions. I've got some things that I really care about that I think about. You've got things that you care about that you think about, and it's probably not the same things. Maybe there's some intersection, maybe there's not. Maybe the dimensions of these vector spaces are very, very different. Now, is that what's really happening? I don't know. It's just a model for now. We'll talk about uh, reasonability later. So I got my opinions, you got your opinions, they're different. We want different vector spaces. What's happening over the edges? Oh, the edges is when we're talking. Hey, what do you think about the Eagles last night? Or hey, what do you think about the election coming up, right? And what we're talking about, those topics, might be totally different than what I really care about or what I've got inside me. It might be really uh, different than what you have got inside of you or what you really care about. 
And what's interesting is the transformations that go from my internal beliefs to what I'm saying out loud. These expression maps, if we were to model them as linear transformations, would give us the structure of one of these sheaves of vector spaces. So really simple example, let's say the topic for discussion is, hey, let's go to Mars. Maybe not something that you've thought about. Maybe, you know, maybe on, on your side, you, uh, you have some feelings about risk. Maybe you're more uh, risk averse. Maybe you dig space. And some combination of those uh, core beliefs uh, permit you to formulate an initial impression. Um, yeah, maybe, I don't know, that sounds kind of cool, but I'm a little worried. Mm. The other per person <coughs> in the conversation might be, uh, oh wow, I really dig tech, this would be cool, it would lead to so many interesting things, and I think it's good to get off this planet, it might be nice, right? And then that person might have a very favorable opinion of this. And then, you know, we might discuss and then see what happens. And I think that this structure is really interesting for being able to capture the difference between what's inside and what's expressed. It's a very flexible model in that if, let's say, we were talking about politics, I could tell you how I really feel. And then I could turn around and tell you how I really feel. And you're not getting the same linear transformation because I might uh, code switch. I might, I might say things differently to different people. I might obfuscate or say, well, you know, I don't really, I don't really think about that all that much. Don't really have an opinion. Very, very flexible model, very interesting. And, it, and this, is, this is what I like about sheaves. I think it's cool. Okay, so all of this uh, sort of technical language, all this ah, scary notation, all has very, very concrete descriptions when you're thinking about opinion dynamics. Zero cochains are just opinion distributions over people. One cochains are public expressions of opinions over these edges. The co-boundary map is measuring sort of how far apart are we as we're talking about this stuff, as we're trying to, trying to come to consensus. How far, do we have to, how far do we have to go? And then the interesting thing, the zero-dimensional cohomology is measuring how close is the system to something like expressed consensus, where, you know, we're doing politics, we're all locked in the room, and we have to come to a compromise and figure something out. And I think diffusion here, like we talked about earlier, is key. Let's take a few minutes and talk about Laplacians again, but a slightly different Laplacian. Maybe you saw Laplacians in calculus. Maybe you learned calculus the way we teach it at Penn, in terms of differential forms, one forms, two forms, zero forms, all that kind of stuff, where you've got a derivative that acts in different ways, like a gradient, or a curl operator, or a divergence operator. And when that multivariable calculus grows up, it turns into a certain type of cohomology that can tell you about the shape of a manifold of a space. We don't do all that in multivariable calculus class, nor should we, but there's some really cool stuff there. It's all about Laplacians. And here's the idea. We can do the same thing with the kinds of sheaves that we've been talking about. The simple cellular model and then much more complex models as well. In particular, everything that we've been working with is assuming that these vector spaces have bases associated with them, right? My opinions, your opinions. So that means that we can look at the co-boundary operator and its transpose, its adjoint, whatever you want to call it. And we can write down the exact same formula for a Laplacian, a Hodge Laplacian, if you want to use the calculus terminology or the algebraic geometry terminology. And this, when we're looking at what is happening with zero-dimensional cochains with the data over vertices, this is the graph Laplacian. This very fancy abstract sheaf, sheaf, sheaf. This really is the graph Laplacian. What do I mean? Oh, do you remember when I said you could write down the graph Laplacian as uh, this, this boundary matrix and its transpose done together? That's exactly what we're doing in this much uh, more elevated context. And if you were writing things down in terms of matrices, it would be the exact same thing if you're in the context where you're 
space is a graph, and you have a one-dimensional vector space over every vertex, every edge, with what kind of transformations between them? Just the identity map. Just the, I'm telling the truth. And you're telling the truth, we're all talking about the same opinion thing. The basic results that get you started are that if you compute the kernel of this sheaf Laplacian, if you look at the harmonic cochains, you get the sheaf cohomology. You get the connected components for the global sections. You get all the higher dimensional stuff as well. And because you've got some geometry built in, this lets you do things like talk about how far away are we from having a global section, from having consensus. And this is the beginning of lifting spectral graph theory to spectral sheaf theory, which is really, really cool stuff that we can't talk about. What we are going to talk about is harmonic convergence because these cochains that are in the kernel of the Laplacian, these harmonic cochains are, in the context of opinion distributions, literally harmonic. Go back to that classic result of Taylor. You remember that, right? 1968. Use the graph Laplacian, you evolve it, and everyone believes the same thing. Now, take that same result and translate it to discourse sheaves where now everyone has multiple and different opinions, everyone is talking about different things, and everyone is choosing how they're expressing themselves to which people. If you use the sheaf Laplacian to set up either a continuous time heat equation or a discrete time heat equation, evolve it, then no matter what the initial opinion distribution is, it evolves to a state of harmonic opinion distributions. You evolve to something that's in the kernel of the sheaf Laplacian. You evolve to a global section, a zero-dimensional cohomology class. And in fact, you evolve to the closest harmonic cochain, the closest opinion distribution that has everybody agreeing. But is it really agreeing? What does this really mean? Does this mean that everyone believes the same thing? No, it does not. What it means is that people have modified so that when they express what it is they believe, we're in consensus. We're OK. We're OK with that. But internal beliefs, internal states, hidden and private. I think that's kind of interesting. And that's really just the beginning, because that's, uh, that Taylor theorem is, is very, very uh, elementary and simple. There's a short stack of results that uh, Jacob Hansen and I did that are of the form, you know, if you have some people who are stubborn, who don't change their opinions, propagandists, what happens to everyone else if they change their beliefs according to the propaganda that they hear? Interestingly, this is related to issues of harmonic extension. And there are various cohomology classes, relative cohomology classes, that tell you about existence and uniqueness of these. In fact, you add a little control theory, you do a bit of controllability, a bit of observability, and you can get conditions under which this set of propagandists can completely control the output states of this set of observables, which sounds all very, uh, you know, clean when said that way, but if you think about what that really means, it's a little, a little concerning. Hmm. The thing that I would like to uh, go over a little bit has to do with this last thing, and one of the faults, and there are many, but one of the faults of this model has to do with the fact that this diffusion operation is assuming that everyone is changing their internal states and keeping their expressions the same and their, 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 their expressed values are changing based on internal changes. And I'm not sure that that's always the case. I think what is the case is that people are changing not their core basis opinions, but they're changing how they express them, which would be a different type of evolution. It would be an evolution not on zero-dimensional cochains, but an evolution in the space of discourse sheaves. And the highly technical but interesting thing that I'm going to skip ahead to is a theorem that says you can set up a heat equation on the space 
of discourse sheaves where people can keep their internal opinions the same but modify the morphisms, modify the expressions. That's technical, it's complicated. I wasn't supposed to get that technical. So, so, let me do a simple example. You're listening to this talk. Let's set up a discourse sheaf. Everything is one dimensional. Do you like this talk or not? And I don't know, maybe, maybe you're like, okay, it's kind of okay. Now, look to your left, look to your right, and then tell the person what you, what you think. And you think it's, you know, not a bad talk. It's okay, I kind of like it. But then you talk to the person on the one side, and they're like, no, 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 this is a great talk. This is so cool. I, I want to, you know, use this to influence the presidential election. And you say what you think. And then you talk to the person on the other side, and you're like, oh, come on. This was supposed to be an elementary talk. This is like she, the cohomology, and all this stuff. This talk sucks. Get me out of here. They lock the doors. Okay, so what happens if you have to keep talking to these people, if you're locked in a room and you're, you're trying to do politics, um, you know, de facto, I think what is going to happen is you're going you're to evolve how you express your belief rather than how you change your belief. You're going to tilt things a little bit. You might tilt in different directions with different people. But eventually, we learn to communicate. And we learn how to get along. And sometimes that involves learning how to lie to the person that you are talking to. And it's interesting that this model is flexible enough to be able to handle that just with simple diffusion dynamics. And this is the end, but don't clap because this is not the end. This is of course not the end. This is just, this is just the beginning of where the math really gets interesting. Because I said, what did I say? I said I wanted to transcend linear algebra, right? What have I been talking about the whole time? Linear algebra, right? Linear transformations. Who's to say that what is happening inside of you in terms of your core beliefs is a vector space? Who's to say that when you're formulating expressions of opinions, that that's a linear transformation? That if you double the intensity of how you feel about everything, that you double the intensity of your expressions? I kind of think it's nonlinear hanging out on Twitter, right? Yeah. Um, it would be better if we had um, you know, a different model, a model that was more general. And I've spent some time thinking about how to make these tools work in more nonlinear settings. And the thing that I am most excited about, or one step along that direction, is some joint work with Hans Ries, who is a postdoc in engineering at Duke University. He's close by. You could talk with him about this stuff. He's on the job market. And he's great. He's doing some really interesting stuff that uses more logical data. And the tools, the mathematical entities that we're using to express this are lattices, algebraic lattices, things that can capture Boolean algebras and a lot of other cool stuff as well. Now, I can't go too far into the details here, but roughly speaking, you should think of a lattice as a partially ordered set. We've got, you know, sort of down here and then up here, and I can say where the heights are different, along with a couple of operations that allow me to do things like take a maximum, that's a join, or something like a minimum, that's a meet. This is like a logical uh, or, a logical and. And there's lots of different ways to think about these things, and these show up all over the place. Power set lattices, Boolean algebras, other things as well. And what I want to do is work with sheaves of these entities as a way of saying everyone has their own internal logic. And when we talk about things, there's some sort of internal logic that's going on. Why might that be a better model? I think if you, if you look at the way that lattices are, are sort of part way between being linear and nonlinear entities, there's a lot that you can do with them. For example, if you look at um, just the, the, the psychology and the linguistics of how we say whether something is true or not, it's really um, not a totally ordered set of, of words that have meanings. It's much more better modeled by a, a partially ordered set. Maybe a lattice is a good structure for it. 
where you know we got totally true, totally false, but then in between there's a whole bunch of other interesting things. I mean, I I I know that a likely is definitely stronger than doubtful, but you know, in between there might be a whole bunch of things that I can't say which is is stronger than the other. In terms of opinions as well, different people have sorts of you know, different ways of expressing stuff. Let's go back to truth. Let's go back to, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be insulting people. Okay, so let's say I've got my sort of internal uh, logic for how I'm expressing something, and you've got your internal logic, but I can't see it. I don't know what it is. It's probably very different than mine. And maybe I can make sense of totally true and totally false. But then, to be honest, I might actually not know what's inside of me. And I think it's kind of obvious that you don't know what you really think about things. The only thing that we can measure, the only thing that we can observe, is talk and what we say, which might have its own structure. I might say, yes, sure, sure. And you might say, sure, sure. That joke gets more laughs in New York. And we, we might not mean exactly the same thing, but all I can do is express myself in a common language and listen to you expressing yourself and try to pull back to some sort of internal state. And you're doing the same thing. And guess what? That is the structure of a sheaf, a sheaf of lattices over the communication network. And so what I would really like to be able to do in my remaining few minutes is retell the same story. Let's do the same thing. Let's build chief cohomology, and let's do Hodge theory and Laplacians, and let's prove all these theorems. But now, now it's not simple linear algebra. Now, this is really tough stuff. Why? Because, for the experts in the room, um, you know, you look at lattice morphisms, and this, this is not giving you an abelian category. You can't talk about kernels and images and mods, and this is, uh uh, doesn't work. So, what are you going to do? Okay, well, I'm gonna to have to be brief, but Hans and I worked out what we think is the right notion of a Laplacian in this case. And we are calling this out as the Tarski Laplacian, based on Tarski's old work in lattices. He has a famous fixed point theorem that is really cool, really strong, and really deeply connected to where this came from and how we're using it. And there is a heat equation. There is an analog of the Taylor theorem and the discourse sheaf theorem that says, if we use this Tarski Laplacian and evolve it over and over in a discrete time system, we look at the fixed point set of the identity operator meet the Tarski Laplacian, then what these fixed points are are exactly the global sections of the sheaf. It's computing the zero dimensional cohomology the same way that Laplacian flow would, the same way that a discrete time heat equation would. And we can also build a cohomology theory for higher dimensions that mimics harmonic cochains. There's been and that all sounds theoretical, and it is kind of theoretical, but the theoretical comes first, and then the applications. And Hans has been really on a roll doing some excellent applications to distributed logic systems, where you're looking at different variants of the Tarski Laplacian that give you belief consensus, using a bit of modal logic. He's got some more recent work having to do with uh, trading networks and some tropical geometry. Again, Tarski Laplacian fueling all this. What I want to do next is jack it up even further and make a categorical version of this using some enriched category theory. That's phew, it's way out there. We're not going to talk about that. <sighs> what I'm going to say is that I really think that lattices and logical valued data are the right generalization from vector space data, not just in opinion dynamics, but in much more as well. You look at everything that's happening in machine learning, convolutional neural networks, all that stuff, all the data, it's vectorized. 
And sometimes that process of vectorizing the data is very unnatural, breaks some things. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do neural networks with logical valued data, where individual nodes have their own internal logic and they communicate, they pass. If we can build such structures and learn with them, and guess what convolutional neural networks use? Convolution. And guess what that's related to? Laplacians. So the end game here is to be able to amplify machine learning and neural networks with categorical data that goes beyond vector spaces and linear transformations. And now this really is the end, but I want to acknowledge all the folks who have been working with me on this project over many years. And I want to thank you for your patience in sitting through what was not entirely an elementary talk, but I hope that it was at least entertaining. Thank you. In using lattices as opposed to vector spaces, um, is there no way to use vector spaces to create a faithful representation of lattices and the trans and the morphisms between them? I think it may be possible to take the lattice elements, use them as a basis for a vector space, try to make things work. But ah, I really want to stay in the lattice world and not vectorize the data. I think you, you sometimes lose something when you just go straight to vectorization. I'm not, I'm not saying that there's anything uh, wrong with the amazing things that we could do with machine learning now with vectorized data. It's awesome, but I would love to be able to push things to the most general category. And I think lattices are not the end, but rather a stepping stone to it. From so for most of your talk, you mentioned things converging into points, like into a singular decision and things like that, right? But like for dynamics, we have things like limit cycles and like l larger things. So are those captured by these models? Oh, great question. If, uh, if you didn't hear uh, precisely, the question is, what about dynamics other than just, you know, global attractor to a fixed point, right? What about more interesting dynamics where you have things like uh, limit cycles? right? Fads, where people believe things in cycles. Totally untouched, haven't done it. I think there's a lot of alpha in starting with the system that we have and doing reaction diffusion dynamics. And I think that that's where you're going to see polarization is if you do some reaction diffusion equations. And I now have the excuse that I'm an associate dean. So I, I, haven't, I haven't done that. I just haven't had enough time. But this is uh, completely open. We'd love to see someone do that. Hi. Uh, thank you for your talk. Appreciate it. Um, I just basically wanted to ask, because I was just, we were recently, I don't think it's working. But... All right. Um, thanks. <laughs> so, uh, just recently, I was thinking about like MS data, for example, and what you said about embedding data as a lattice rather than a vector space is super natural in this context here, right? Because with MNEST, you're flattening it down, and you're losing on structure. I haven't gotten a chance to think a ton about it, but I was just wondering if you could share, like, basically what, I don't know if you see the question I'm trying to but like, how can lattices, in the simple example of handwritten digits, uh, allow you to amplify the structure of your, the information that you're getting from a particular data point? That's an excellent question. I don't know how to make the lattice story work well in vision. All of my work, the past couple of years that I've been thinking about this, I have been working in the area of beliefs. 
Uh, one of the things that I think lattices are really good for is modeling not just what I believe, but why I believe it. What are my reasons for it? You can think about that as a binary relation, right? Here the, here's the list of things I believe. Here's the list of bits of evidence that I have. And these pieces of evidence contribute to these beliefs. Take that binary relation, the way to turn that into a lattice. It's called a Galois lattice. And it's really easy to set those guys up for making the story work because they're complete lattices. They fit nicely. They have good uh, Galois connections between them. And it allows you to do argumentation, not just at the level of, well, I think this, well, I think that, but well, I think this, and here's why. Oh, well, I think this, and here's why. And it's a, it's a much more refined way of doing this kind of opinion dynamics. That is as yet unpublished. That's, that's joint work with my student, Miguel Lopez. Uh, but I hope that we get a preprint out on that later this year. I don't know how to make this work with vision examples, in part because vectorizing it seems to work really well, right? So I haven't been motivated to go to that area yet. Um, something I'm curious about is, uh, does this um, strategy using lattices uh, and the, considering the dynamics of these lattice sheets, um, does it encapsulate it when people you, you mentioned that we're now looking at um, what happens when people change how they express their opinions with each other. Um, does this also work for expressing how people's personal uh, weighting of their beliefs change over time? Yeah, so good question. I set up a dichotomy where either you evolve things where internal beliefs change and the expression maps stay the same, or internal beliefs are fixed and the expression maps change. You change how you communicate. Could you do both? The answer is yes. Uh, this does appear in the paper with Jacob. And you can weight things so that it's stronger or weaker. Very flexible model. But again, only set up for just sort of basic diffusion. There's a lot more dynamic play that one could do. I can't hear. Ah. Okay, so the question is, so, so you are basically talking about how to represent information, right? I mean, you so, sort of, you are departing from vectors toward lattices and more complex structures and perhaps, I mean, there are other ways like you can do tensors and things like that. But is there a room for looking at this from the density perspective, like information density and uh, entropies and uh, what, like, you know, what people do in, uh, like if you go back to like years ago to uh, I don't know Kolmogorov diameters. I mean, can you comment on this? I can comment on my ignorance and say that I don't know how entropy fits into the picture. I also would love to see how this kind of thing interfaces with all the classical work in information geometry, uh, Fisher information, all of that stuff. There's a lot out there that I don't know exactly how it fits into this picture. Now, in the context of Galois lattices, there are a number of different notions of entropy associated with those that I know a thing or two about, but I don't know how it interfaces with the sheaf dynamics. Um, the things that I don't know greatly outweigh what I do. Yes, I have a question about the the diffusion you use and the way that you model the discourse as someone taking their own inner beliefs and that could change how they portray it to different individual people. Um, but what if, or what does this model show about how that person would change what they're saying, what they're talking to multiple people at once and they need to express something how they would do so if they announced it. This is a question. Everything that I've talked about is pairwise conversation, pairwise discourse. And all the sheaves that we've talked about have been in the simplest possible setting of a sheaf 
over a network where you've got data over vertices, data over edges. But sometimes we get a bunch of people in a room where you got to talk. And sometimes the conversation is different when you're talking three or four people all at once than when you talk in pairs and then try to coordinate. You've seen this, right? You know it's different. What this would lead to would be not a one-dimensional base space, but a higher dimensional base space. Fortunately, sheaf theory was built for such things. That's the good news. The bad news is, wow, zero-dimensional cohomology only depends on data on the vertices and edges. If it's really a sheaf, functional reality, everything higher dimensional, it just works out, right? Cohomology doesn't care about the higher dimensional stuff in grading zero. So the bad news is, you want to capture those kinds of more complex opinion dynamics, you're not just going to be able to say, oh, it's a sheaf over a simplicial complex. Uh-uh. You're either going to need to break the sheaf condition or break your base space and make uh, something more complex, like maybe a subdivision. I haven't done that. I don't know how to do it. I think it's a really interesting open question. So exciting and mind blowing. Um, my question is kind of about the placing of vertices and showing the proximity of people who we would assume would talk more. And my question relates to part of how we would form identities, the key uh, identifying things. Like, we're not people in this room. Um, versus if we brought in a philosopher who dealt with logic, they might have a different way of looking at this. Would you map these kind of identifying things as um, maybe a parallel sheaf in a, uh, a vector space, or is that part of the lattice work? Those are good questions. I'm not entirely sure. What I can say is that with the advent of the social networks that we have, Proximity is not necessarily a proxy for communication, right? If, if I follow you on Twitter, then you know, we might chat, even though far apart, maybe never even met you. That, as we have seen, maybe you're not on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Twitter too much. But it's, those are complex dynamics. And all, all kinds of interesting things can happen. Having a whole group of people who are very, very similar, maybe by way of their profession, although there's going to be a lot of diversity along a lot of other different axes. That's what I like about this model. It allows you to pack all that diversity inside and not assume that people who do the same things believe the same way. I think there's lots of interesting questions in terms of dynamics. What happens if you have a social network with people in consensus and you introduce someone who's very different, expressing very different views? How can things change? How can one person influence a group? Tons and tons of papers on these kinds of things with lots of different models out there. Again, opinion dynamics, really huge area, lots of interesting work being done. Uh, a fantastic talk, thank you very much. Um, I'd love to hear your uh, thoughts or perhaps speculate on whether or not this model accounts for things like the context of discourse between individuals or even the hierarchical nature of relationships or the demographic nature of the vertices within your uh, uh, networks, for example, whether or not that influences the transformation from internal to external or the speed to which the convergence is met, context and also the nature of the, the people who are discoursing. Those are interesting, complex issues. What is really nice about the sheaf model is that this is really one of the only models that I've seen out there that allows for context-dependent communication, where you can be talking to a superior in one mode or manner, talking to a colleague in a very different, perhaps more frank, manner. It's for that reason that, that I like this model very much. I think the, the most interesting challenge in the, the many challenges that you stated was that about how things 
can change over time, how the way that you express yourself, relationships, how that can all be time dependent. The stuff that I've talked about assumes sort of a, a static structure and then things evolve internally or maybe in terms of expression, but what happens if the network is changing over time? People come, people go. Lots of interesting work to be done there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just had a question sort of related to the reasonability part. Um, have you talked to sociologists, psychologists, um, people in fields like that to sort of, you know, did some of these ideas come from those kinds of fields or have you talked to people to sort of assess the reasonability or were these sort of things that you all came up with? So, uh, and the question was, um, how does this play in the social psychology world? And was interaction with them part of the creation of this model? Second question, now, I, I made up this model just to try to explain to someone what uh, Sheaf is and come up with a concrete example that people could understand. And it seemed like opinions and arguing over politics was something that everybody can understand. So that's where this model came from. In terms of how this plays in those communities, the perennial challenge is being able to communicate the mathematics to people who are not mathematicians in a way that they can feel like uh, they want to engage with. That's a challenge. That's tough. That's really hard. I have uh, spoken on this in a, a couple of different venues where there are people in the audience who are experts in the more sociological uh, side of opinion dynamics. And, you know, there's a diversity of responses, some of which is, that's intriguing. We'd love to see more about this. Some of which is, show us real data on which uh, you prove that this is how things go. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> don't do that. I'm the mathematician here, so yeah. Um, I have one in your capillary question and ask you that. Uh, have, have the model been tested against like a real world observations? And if they have been, uh, on what time scale have been like, evolution of opinions been observed, and what is the degree of agreement? No. Has not been tested, in part because um, I get bored easily, and I move on, and I want to do other things, and I really want to get uh, machine learning to use lattice value data. I don't want to be a sociologist, and I don't want to, I don't want to talk about political discourse. That, that, ay ay ay. Um, I think it would be interesting for someone to do if they want to do that. That's great, but um, yeah, sorry, I'm I'm the mathematician. I've come up with the model, and also, how do you test it? How do you test it? I don't know. I'm not trained as a sociologist. I don't know how to test it. How do you measure people's internal states? I don't think it's possible. I think the only thing that we can measure is what they express, what they say. In which case, how do you infer what was happening inside? How do you infer, are people changing their beliefs or are they changing their expressions? I don't know how to measure it. What I do know is that a really simplistic model, like the one from 1968, is not supple enough to really capture what's going on. I'm not naive enough to think that the model that I came up with, having no training in sociology or social psychology, is the model. So, Part of why I'm not testing is I don't think it's I don't think it's right. All models are wrong. Some are more interesting than others. I think it's an interesting model. I have a second question. Uh, in this model, it appears like the groups are always alike, whereas like in real world, people can die and new people are born. Also, like ones who are dead obviously cannot communicate, but then they stop evolving. But if they have their discourse in different forms somewhere online, new people are still communicating with the old discourse, or how like, has that been captured into the body? And, uh, and if not, then do you have any ideas? Yeah, really interesting question. Again, going back to the problem of what happens over time when the sheaf itself is 
changing. And let's say, as you're talking about, the base space is changing. Nodes appear, nodes disappear. The way that I would think of to handle this, that we've done some work towards, is, oh, I have a sheaf over here at this time, and then I have a sheaf over here at a future time. How do I compare them? It would be nice if I had something like a transformation that allowed me to map things forward in time and do comparisons, or maybe pull back so that I could see what's happening. You might think that this language of sheaves is sort of overkill, right? You're using this big hammer to just do simple network linear algebra. But the, th the thing that's so useful about it is people have built up these enormous theories, this great edifice. And so there's a notion of a sheaf morphism that allows you to connect two different sheaves and allows you to change those base spaces. So yeah, sheaf morphism, sequences of sheaf morphisms, ways that you decompose them into things called resolutions. All of that technology, I think, should be imported from sheaf theory as the right language to address these sorts of things. One more. Um, you mentioned your interest in machine learning models that use lattice valued uh, nodes, for example. Um, how, what exactly do you have in mind for, uh, say, an implementation of that? Um, if you were to want to test it in some manner. Oh, how? I haven't worked out the theory yet. I... Oh, uh, the theory comes first in my world, then the implementation. Yeah, I'm, you got me. I'm, I'm done. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great talk.